Thank you. Uh, well, it's 2016, and I think it's safe to say that everybody's using version control, right? I certainly hope so. Well, that may be, but if you're not misusing your version control system, you may not appreciate what a powerful, powerful tool version control is for pessimizing workflow and minimizing developer productivity. Because you're plugged in, informed people. You go to conferences. You probably read blog posts or go to user group meetings. You know what everybody wants, what everybody's talking about these days. How do I pessimize my workflow and minimize developer productivity? Because if you don't do those two things, you're at risk of actually shipping software. And version control is a fantastically powerful tool if you do it wrong for avoiding those terrible fates. And I'm going to, now you could, you could spend years of your life um, poking around in the dark, trying to find your own worst practices. And you'd pro I'm sure you would find some on your own, but I've, I've seen a few um, and uh, I've, I've done a few myself. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna share some, some time-tested um, worst practices guaranteed to set you down the wrong path from day one. So without further ado, number one, uh, a classic uh, is commit any old crap. Um, hmm? Is it cut off? Oh dear. <laughs> now I blame CSS. Uh, let me see. Does anybody know what the supposed resolution of the projector is? Or just unminimize the browser. Does that help? Yeah, okay, it doesn't need to be full screen. Okay, so time honored classic is to commit any old crap. Um, you probably made some source tarball you found on the internet uh, for a dependency that you're using. Put it in version control. Or maybe it's not a dependency that you're using. You just thought you should hang on to it. Yeah, version control is a good place to put it. Maybe last week or five years ago, you built some RPMs or Debian packages or whatever. Put them in version control. You wouldn't want to lose them, would you? If you're using a compiled language, you probably have lots of object files or class files or executables or whatever your compiler outputs, well, they're pretty important, right? You can't run your software without them. Put them in version control. Um, how many of you have not actually found all your bugs until the code goes to production and actually runs against a real workload? Yeah, we've all done that. It's OK. Don't feel bad. So of course, if you're a, um, you know, a, a good little programmer, you're going you're gonna to take the bug that you found in production and write a test so that it doesn't happen again. Well, how do you reproduce it? Well, you take that giant data file or a database or image or whatever your data happened to be that triggered the bug in production, and you put it in version control. You'll never lose it. Um, this last idea is a little bit contentious, a little controversial. There are some people who would claim you should put your own source code in version control. Maybe, maybe. I think the jury's out on that one. Number two, it's not just a version control system, it's a backup tool, but it's a funny kind of backup tool. Um, you may be used to backup tools that run in the middle of the night and just automatically back everything up whether you want to or not. Well, when you use your version control system as a backup tool, there's a few differences. Like, you get to decide when to run a backup. And they don't call it backup. For some strange historical reason, it's called committing your files. I don't know where that came from. Um, also, you can pick and choose which files you want to back up, or not, if you're following the commit any old crap school of version control. And finally, you have to type some text to justify why you need to do a backup right now, which is weird, because everybody knows backups are a good thing. So if you're using an appropriate version control system, you can just skip that explanatory text. Get to that later. Um, number three, um, this is you know a problem we've had since there was more than one computer on the planet, is how do I share files between these computers? There are people who will tell you there are many ways to share files: NFS, FTP, email, Dropbox, HTTP, Samba, blah blah blah, lots, right? Lots and lots. 
they're wrong. There's only one way to share files. You put them in version control. Really, if you need to get a bunch of bytes from point A to point B, your version control system will do it. So why not? Remember, one of the first rules of programming is, if it can be done, it should be done. I don't know where this came from. All right, worst practice number four is more of a, a meta worst practice or a family of worst practices. And it, and it takes a bit of explanation because it, it kind of seems wait a little, a little bit weird to why am I talking about version control and being a, a lone wolf? Because there are a lot of people who will tell you that version control is a good thing because it enables collaboration and it enables sharing. These are sad, misguided people who have not learned the lessons of history because the word collaboration in English is special. It's, it's a special kind of cooperation. It means to cooperate with an enemy army during wartime. So here are two very famous, well-known collaborators from history. Um, Mr. Quisling on the left is, is such an infamous collaborator that his very name is synonymous with betrayal and treachery. Um, Marshal Pétain on the right, same thing, but in French. Um, really, as, as for, so, you know, don't talk to me about collaboration. As for sharing, the logical extreme of sharing is communism. And anybody who knows their history will realize that every time communism has been implemented somewhere, it has led to terrible suffering, starvation, um, millions of deaths. It's, it's really a horrible system. So really, you know, collaboration, not good. Sharing, not good. Uh, real programmers are lone wolves. And the true lone wolf learns to use his or her version control system to discourage these nefarious practices of collaboration and sharing. For example, worst practice number five, which is really the first in the, the family of version control to support being a lone wolf, commit messages are for losers. If you are using a classic version control system, one of the real gems of the um, genre from days gone by, such as CVS or Visual Source Safe, they don't even insist on commit messages. Um, more modern version control systems have this annoying tick where you must apply a non-empty commit string to justify your backup. Yeah, that's easy to fool. You can just type ongoing dev. And if that's too much work, you can type whip. That's short for work in progress. or the time-honored classic, dot. Uh, number six. This can, so committing broken code, another classic, um, can be seen as an artful combination of committing any old crap and using your version control system as a backup tool, as a backup tool too. Um, but it's, it's such an important worst practice that it really deserves to be highlighted on its own. Because after all, <clears throat> the first thing a would-be collaborator is going to do if they want to interfere with your project is check out the source code. What's the next thing they're going to do? Build it and run the tests. It's pretty hard to stop them from checking out the code, although it's worth trying. But you can certainly stop them from building it and running the tests by committing code that doesn't build or it doesn't pass its tests. And trust me, nothing will discourage a would-be collaborator faster than checking out the code and, oh, it doesn't even work. Uh, why am I wasting my time on this? Perfect. You got rid of undesired interference. Perfect. Works brilliantly. Um, the opposite extreme, of course, um, I'm just not ready to commit. Um, there is an obvious tension here. You might think these two are mutually exclusive. And just a pro tip, when you're starting out with version control worst practices, you really should treat these two as mutually exclusive. It's, it's either or. Pick one or the other. Uh, if you just can't bring yourself to commit broken code, well, hold off for two or three weeks. Wait until everything is absolutely perfect before you commit. Because after all, software is hard to change, right? really hard to change. And the only thing that's harder to change than, than source code is source code that's been committed to source control, so, I mean, to version control. Uh, don't call it source control, because then people will think you're not supposed to put binaries and RPMs in it. Call it version control, and they'll think you can put anything in. Um, 
Anyway, so yeah, yeah, one or the other, right? Hold off. I either commit broken code or hold off for two or three weeks until it's absolutely perfect. Now, once you have achieved mastery of version control worst practices, then you can think about combining these two. Um, but don't go there until you're really comfortable. You really have some expertise under your belt because it takes it takes real chutzpah to hold off for two or three weeks and then commit broken code. Leave that to the pros. You'll get there, don't worry. Um, worst practice number eight. You've just had a really uh, super productive afternoon. You've uh, fixed two bugs, implemented a feature, uh, renamed a stupid variable, and I don't know, uh, cleaned up some ugly indentation. Wow, great afternoon. You know that feeling, right? Happens about once a month. Well, you better commit it all right now because you, who knows? Your disk might fail overnight. Uh, after all, it's a backup tool too. Um, this might not seem like such an obvious worst practice because maybe maybe everything works. You know, you've done a day's worth of work. Everything compiles. The tests all pass. Of course, you should commit it all right now. How's that going to interfere with collaboration and sharing? Well, <clears throat> it doesn't interfere with it right now. What it does is it makes history harder to interpret, harder to decipher. It's hard, when somebody is looking at this change six months or two years down the road, it's harder to figure out, well, was this variable renamed at the same time this feature was implemented for a good reason, or is that just coincidence? So what you're doing is you're just throwing a little, a little grit in the, in the works. Uh, you're just slowing future collaborators and sharers down just a little bit, just a little static. Um, there's a related technique that's supported by, by these modern distributed version control systems. You can work for five minutes, commit, work for 10 minutes, commit, 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 commit all day, and then squash all your commits into one. The technology is different, but the end result is the same. So I really consider that the same as commit at all right now. It doesn't really matter if, if you squash a whole bunch of commits into one or if you wait till the end of the day and commit everything together. It's, it looks the same six months from now, right? So whatever. Um, ba -ba -bum. Number nine, finally, we got to something a little controversial, a little contentious, the monolithic repository. So the idea here is you have an organization of dozens or hundreds of people all typing away all day long on various source files or whatever. Um, they're all employed by the same organization. Their paycheck comes from the same place. So of course it follows, as the night follows the day, that all of these projects, files, source code, whatever they are, should follow the same release schedule, the same deployment policy, have the same branch, branch schedule. Everything should be the same, so they should all be in a single gigantic version control repository. Um, very effective technique for, for causing development to grind to a halt. Um, I've seen this personally, it's, it's not pretty um, because you can have one team that's ready to release, but you can't release because another team still has two more weeks worth of work to do and the first team has to find something to keep themselves busy so they get to work but they can't commit anything to trunk because you have to branch trunk but you can't branch trunk yet because the other team isn't ready. Ugh, not good. Now, I have been told that some organizations use the monolithic repository in a very effective and productive way, like Google, um, because they don't have a single branching policy, a single version number across the entire tree. Well, you don't want to be like Google, right? You don't want to be productive. You don't want to ship software. Be careful. This is not about best practices, but about worst practices, about how to misuse version control. Um, so. The thing about monolithic repository is you can do it right or you can do it wrong. Please, do it wrong. I beg of you. Uh, number 10, the flip side of the monolithic repository. And this one, uh, to the best of my, my knowledge, these two really are mutually, mutually exclusive. I don't think you can combine these in the same organization. But the, you know, it's Tuesday. It's time to create a new microservice. And new microservice means a new micro repository. Um, Seems sensible, right? You know, if you look at your uh, where the OS on your laptop or your server comes from, it's probably comes from thousands of different packages built from thousands of different projects. Each one of which should, 
each one of which is a small to medium version control repository. The reason this is sometimes or can be an effective worst practice is because no matter what language, no matter what tool you're using, you're going to have a bit of repetitive boilerplate every single time you create a new source repository. More boilerplate means more lines of code. More lines of code means you look more smarter. Um, as an extra added bonus, it makes it harder to explore the overall body of source code and harder to make um, wide scale changes. So definitely slowing things down with micro repositories. Uh, let's see, number 11, not only is your version control system a backup tool, it's a database too. Think about it. You've got some structured data, fits in a, re it's a regular, consistent, uh, fits nicely in a table, uh, in a text file, um, and, and it's read frequently, it's written frequently, it, it might grow uh, unbounded. Well, of course you put it in your version control system. It's not like there's a dedicated tool we can use for this kind of problem, is there? Um, no, certainly not. Um, it, and uh, let's see, oh, another, it's, it's gremlins. Somebody's been inserting slides. Okay, speaking of, speaking of databases, um, there's a little known truth of computer science. This, this is not a truth of computer science. This is, this is an immutable fact of the universe. This is like the, the ratio of a, uh, uh, you know, the speed of light or the ratio of a circle's radius to its circumference. Um, when your hardware is running a database system, something magical happens. There's no latency. Everything runs super fast because when it's running a database system, the disks spin at infinite speed, memory chips have zero latency, and all machine opcodes execute in zero time. Um, if you've never seen application code that is based on this fundamental truth of the universe, don't worry, you will. Um, it's out there waiting for you to find. Um, and I, so I, I don't know why they don't teach this in computer science school to the kids these days. Nobody seems to realize that databases run magically fast. So the neat thing about version control systems is so do they. When your hardware is running your version control system, everything happens instantaneously, um, which means that it scales infinitely. It doesn't matter how many files you put in your version control system, how many directories, how many revisions. Performance is always awesome. Um, once you come to accept this immutable truth about your version control system and about your hardware, you will probably let go of any, any lingering resistance you might have to committing any old crap, treating it as a backup tool, the monolithic repository, oh yeah, it's a database too. This just is enables, once, once you realize this fascinating performance aspect of hardware and version control systems, it, it opens the door to lots of other worst practices. Finally, uh, go forth and be creative. Uh, let a thousand flowers bloom, as they say. Um, I've only presented the worst practices that I have direct familiarity and experience with, so I haven't seen everything that people have done. Um, please, go out and think of your own worst practices. Um, remember, collaborators are the enemy. Sharing just leads to mass famine. Um, if we all stick to our own silos, we don't interfere with each other, and we don't allow others to interfere with us, that will, it's, 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 a, it's, a, beautiful, it's a beautiful process. It starts by degrading the experience for your peers, your fellow developers in your organization, and then that spills out to degrade things for other the, the product managers and marketing and sales. They don't have a product to sell, so their phone stops ringing and their level of stress goes down. Um, eventually, your customers go away. They leave you alone in peace and quiet. And it's all about minimizing productivity, pessimizing workflow. And if you do it right, very soon, you will have one of these of your very own. I mean, if you do it wrong. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>
So we have a lot of time actually for questions, yeah. about uh, 10, 9 minutes, uh, if anybody would like to. Only serious ones, please. <laughs> What's the most interesting use of source control that you've been personally familiar with? Most interesting? Yes. Hmm. Hmm. I'd have to say the database. Yeah. Yeah, the database. That was really... <laughs> <laughs> I stopped on the right slide. <laughs> Interestingly, when I, when I first prepared this talk, I completely, I, I must have been such a traumatic memory, I had blanked that out. And I, ga I gave the talk at Montreal Python a couple of weeks ago, and somebody mentioned this anti-pattern, or a variation of it, and the penny dropped, I remembered, oh, I do have... 12 slides plus the bonus number 13. Um, so what is your kind of worst practices around merging and stuff like that that you've seen? Ooh. Um, kind of. Merge early, merge off. Oh, so the, so the, the, I, I think the right way to do it, the, the best practice, satirical hat off, speaking entirely seriously, merge early, merge often. Don't delay merging. Because the longer you leave it, the worse it gets. Oop, I've actually got a new one for you. Uh, to one firm I was at uh, many moons ago, we actually used our version control system as automated deployment. We would check in the binaries, and then on the actual servers, they would check out those binaries to install. And while it might be considered a worse practice, it actually worked pretty well. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not quite sure if it fits in this or, or not, but I, fi but I figured I'd add it to your menagerie of uh, worse it, practices. It, it probably worked great as long as the system scaled to handle that. You wouldn't want to do that with a distributed version control system. The mic must come to the questioner, apparently. <laughs> Fine, thanks. Uh, I, I don't think you're force pushing, force pushing enough. And what do you think about that? <laughs> you know, when I, so when I had the questions after I gave this at Montreal Python two weeks ago, I realized there are mistakes, and then there are worst practices. Um, and, and so, I mean, yes, I, I, I could have got up here and, and, and made fun of, of students and newbies making mistakes. But I think to qualify as an anti-pattern, there, there was a book like 15 years ago called Anti-Patterns. And I think this was about software design anti-patterns. And I think, if, I read it like 15 years ago, so I don't remember exactly, but I believe that they made a, dis a distinction that to be an anti-pattern, it has to be something that you deliberately chose to do. You may not have realized it was the wrong thing to do, but you thought at one point that it was the right thing to do. And like committing your binaries and using it as a deployment system. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think you've missed uh, another anti-pattern, uh, which is using it as a form of RPC. Oh God, I've never even heard of that. Can you can you give us more details? Well, imagine if you will a Jenkins server that downloads a script from version control and runs it every thirty minutes, and that's the only access you have to the machine. <laughs> Is that a worse practice or a horrible workaround? I think we still have a question from the front row. Two questions from the front row. Oh. <laughs> um, so at work, we, we have a practice of just strictly doing rebases than, than merges, other than the merges that are going to happen in GitHub. Uh -huh. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that uh, in your experience. Has merge worked out better for you in, in your local development area or um, rebasing? Yeah, so my, my current gig, I'm in, currently in a, a micro repositories for microservices shop. Um, so merging is not really a big deal because um, 
for any given project, there might be two people working on it in a given week and just doesn't come up. Um, my previous job was wh where the slide about monolithic repositories came from. Um, and merging was a serious problem there. Um, I actually blame myself for the workflow. Um, but I don't, I, th I think if I, if I had a chance to go back and, and so, there, so the reason for the problem at my previous job um, was because it was a fairly large source tree, like 20 or 30,000 files with 40 or 50 developers all contributing to it. One branch, basically quarterly if we were lucky. Um, so what would happen is you'd have three or four or five people doing maintenance work on that branch, and they'd all be trying to merge at the end of the day, and yeah, it can, can get ugly. Uh, that's one of the problems. The other problem, and I, and I, and I think uh, CPython has had this problem. Has it not? With people stepping on each other's toes, merging from 3.6 to trunk? I, saw, I thought I saw a mention of that somewhere. OK, OK. It was definitely a problem at my old job, for the same reason. Lots of people trying to do the same thing in the same repository. Um, what was the other problem? Oh, yeah, order of operations. Quite often, the best place to develop a bug fix, or not often, sometimes the best place to develop a bug fix is the trunk. And sometimes you don't realize that the bug fix actually has to go on that branch from two years ago until long after it's been written. Uh, and um, certainly the way we designed that workflow is everything wanted to be done on the oldest branch and merged forward. Um, didn't have to be that way. I think if I was designing that workflow today, I would design it based on cherry picking, not not rebasing. Because rebasing, right? If you're if you're if you're maintaining a 3.6 branch and a 3.5 branch and a 3.4 branch, you really do have distinct branches of development, and you can't rebase. That's that's just completely nonsensical. Rebasing only makes sense for a two-day or a one-week-long development branch, a topic branch. Um, so yeah. Hi, sorry, I have to ask another serious question. Um, sure. Are you familiar with Git Flow? I have read about it, and I worked a two-week freelance gig once that used it. OK. Um, would you describe, like, how, what do you think of that, like, based on, like, other practices of, like, um, working so, in teams and so so, 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 like I said, I have very little practical experience with Git Flow. My impression of it is somebody tried to create a workflow that solves every single problem. And that's kind of like creating software that solves every single problem. If you've ever used Lotus Notes or Jira, you know what I mean. Those, those are two pieces of software that try to solve every single problem. And as a result, they don't solve any problem very well. Um, and I think, I suspect Gitflow is way more complex than any single user of it needs it to be because it tries to accommodate all possible use cases. I think you're much better off cooking up your own simple, sensible workflow that fits your brain and your organization and your software. Yes. Hi. I just wanted to counter your claims of famine with source control. <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of my previous jobs um, actually employed a lot of anti-patterns like binaries and source control. So we had to create a new job to manage the source control. So uh, source control creates jobs and families. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And as somebody who has been employed formerly as the source control wrangler, it's true, yeah. Paid my salary. Yeah. So I noticed throughout you assumed that everybody was using one version control system. But really, you know, each user should have their own version control that they feel comfortable with. You got me there, yeah. Real thing I've done. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, that breaks down as soon as you have more than, what, five or six users? But 
I, I think it's still a very, sounds like a very effective anti-pad. Sorry? Oh, that's true. Or write your own. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's all the time we have. Thanks very much, Greg. My pleasure. Thank you.